Once again, let's seek the Lord's help as we turn to his word. Lord, we pray that that word implanted would indeed bring a worldwide harvest. And Lord, we long to see that in our own lives, a, a harvest that is pleasing in your sight, fruits of righteousness that come from hearing and understanding your word of appreciating our Lord Jesus Christ afresh this day as we consider familiar truths perhaps a familiar part of your word Lord may it encourage us and may we lift up the name of Jesus as we understand more of just who he is help us then we ask for the glory of the name of our Lord Jesus amen well we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 1 and uh, it's not Ascension Sunday. We don't particularly stick to the church calendar, uh, but Ascension Sunday in the church calendar is actually next week. Uh, but Ascension Day itself celebrates Jesus ascending back to the Father's right hand, as we've read from Acts chapter 1. Uh, it's 40 days after Easter, so it always happens on a Thursday. So this coming Thursday, the 18th of May, is Ascension Day. It's not a public holiday in this country. It's not something we're going to put special services on or anything like that, but I think it's something to be reminded of. And I think it's better to be reminded of before it happens rather than next Sunday after it's happened. So that's why I thought we would take a look at this great truth, uh, reminding ourselves that the exaltation of Jesus doesn't end with his resurrection. He is exalted on high to the Father's right hand. He is the true power. He is the reigning king. And we are his loyal servants who serve a very real, though unseen, king. I hope we'll be encouraged as we think about that, the power that he has. I, I try to not take too many illustrations at all from the events of last weekend, since we, we've been there, done that, we, with the coronation of King Charles III uh, and all the sort of pageantry that went on with that. But as we reflected last week, the power that he has is really just symbolic power, isn't it? It's embarrassing, I think, strutting around with all that sort of regalia uh, as if it was great power on display, as once was perhaps uh, of the kings of this country, but perhaps no more. So we need to put that sort of stuff out of our minds when we're thinking of a king and think of a king who has an everlasting power and who reigns over all from heaven. And we bow the knee gladly before such a king, knowing that he is going to come back just as he's promised and to receive us into the place, the glorious place prepared for all who put their trust in him. Well, let's turn to Acts chapter one. Now we're going to look first of all uh, at verse six. But before that, I mean, we read the introduction, which really reminds us that this is a continuation of the work of Jesus, the book of Acts, and all that is contained in there, written by Luke. He started for Theophilus, uh, giving an accurate and careful account of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. And he's going to go on to describe all that Jesus continued to do through the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives and through the lives of those apostles. A very exciting book the next phase of the ministry of Jesus. But we have that transition uh, that we're going to look at then from uh, verse 6 of Jesus then ascending from heaven, no longer physically present, but nevertheless with his disciples. So they've come together, verse 6, and they've got a question for Jesus, who's been teaching them over these last 40 days, as he appeared to them in different places uh, and from time to time, uh, teaching them, explaining to them time and again. And now it's time for him to return to heaven. And, and there's anticipation of power here from the disciples. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They ask him. Wrong way, sorry. And it's fair to say, sorry, thank you. Fair to say that they had a wrong focus. At this time, what are you going to do now, Jesus? What's next on the agenda? Well, next on the agenda was Jesus returning to heaven. 
but their focus wasn't on that. They were thinking, right, this is something uh, significant that's going to happen now. So nationalistic expectation of what was going to happen to their nation. They were true Israelites. They'd been brought up uh, with a pride in being Jewish and desiring to see the former days of the nation of Israel, where they had a king of their own to be restored. And as we've noticed so often through the Gospels, there seemed to be this expectation that, yes, a Messiah was going to come, but not the sort of Messiah that Jesus was. Humble, servant, suffering, crucified. Surely a Messiah would not be allowed to experience the shame dereliction of that sort of experience. No, the sort of uh, Messiah they were expecting was one who would restore the nation with the might of his arm, in a military sense perhaps, and re-establish the kingship. Jesus tells them, that's really none of your business. Don't focus on the now, don't focus on the nation. Your focus is to be elsewhere, to take this message of my kingdom to the ends of the earth. And we'll go on to think a bit about that in verse 8 later on. So after all the teaching that Jesus had given them, still they seem to have a wrong understanding, an anticipation of what they had previously asked Jesus. Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 37 is the account of where two of the disciples sidle up to Jesus uh, as he's kind of in the final approaches to Jerusalem. Very much clear that the focus of his ministry was the cross at Calvary. And in hearing about this, these two disciples say, "Can, can we have a special request? Will you grant to sit at your right and your left hand in your kingdom? And Jesus has to rebuke them at that time. So I wonder if there's an element here as the disciples are asking again about restoring the kingdom to Israel. Is there a personal element to this? They're thinking, right, if this really, you know, we're convinced Jesus is the Messiah. So therefore, we need to be ready for our position of power as his right and left hand men. Maybe I'm being unfair. And you can tell me that afterwards. But there seems to be certainly a wrong focus that Jesus rebukes them. As a reminder to us, isn't it, by way of application, how many times do we make our journey of faith more complicated because we misinterpret what Jesus says in his word? We have wrong, wrongly focused anticipations. Read the word and we make it very much about us and what God is going to do for us rather than what we are doing for him. An example would be John 14, uh, where Jesus promises that everything that we ask in his name, he will grant because of the power that was in his name. And so easily people would ought to take that as a, right, let's get our prayer shopping list ready because Jesus is just going to grant everything that we ask for as long as we say in the name of Jesus at the end. And of course, it's a completely wrong understanding of what Jesus meant by asking in his name. And we are to pray with his authority and blessing those things that he desires, those things which are honouring to God. How often would our shopping list really be honouring to God? Praise God that so often, I suppose the answer is a firm no from heaven when we ask those things just for our own selfish ambitions. Do we have an expectation, anticipation that Jesus is going to make everything just right now, here in my life? When we don't get that, we're kind of knocked off course. Well, let's learn from those uh, mistaken disciples to have a right focus. John 14 was what we noticed A humble response to Jesus. Verse 7, he he tells him, basically, it's none of your business. It's the Father to give the authority. I've got something different for you. 
As a reminder to us in the verse from Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, and we just have to trust him for those things that have not yet been revealed. But the things that are revealed have been revealed. Those belong to us and to our children that we may do all the words of the law. So God's made it plain what we should do. And when we're not clear, we simply have to trust him on the basis of what he has revealed. That can be complicated, can't it? Let's be honest. Sometimes we're looking for guidance. We're looking for the scriptures and how we need uh, that, that understanding in the sense of all of the scriptures, because so often if we latch on to one particular verse um, and, and make it mean something out of its context, that's when the problems come, isn't it? And that's been so throughout the history of the church. We humbly wait upon him. Well, let's move on. Verse 8 previewing. Jesus tells the disciples in response to their question, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. As we read in Luke 24, behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So the Holy Spirit the power, the authority of Christ was to be given to them for the work that Jesus was giving them to do. This was a new phase. They followed Jesus. Jesus was, was the leader, the teacher, uh, the one who took the initiative, who, who made things happen. And now he was leaving them just as he forewarned them. He told them not to, to be dismayed or discomforted, knowing that he was going with purpose but not just uh, to leave them completely bereft. His ministry on earth had come to an end. And now he was returning to heaven. I don't know if there's any significance to 40 days of resurrection to ascension ministry. 40 days does seem to be a significant number in the Bible, doesn't it? 40 days, 40 years and so on. Um, certainly when Jesus was on that Mount of Transfiguration, the topic of discussion with those who appeared, Moses and Elijah, was his exodus. If you know your Bibles, you'll know that after the exodus, when God delivered his people out of the slavery of Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness because of their rebellion and their refusal to believe in, uh, in God's good promises. Jesus has now had that exodus fulfillment. He is the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, taking away the sin of the world. He's now saying you've, you've been through the 40 days of testing and it's now time to take possession of the promised land. The promised land is not something that uh, Jesus is going to lead them into in the way that Joshua did all those years before. It's a new phase, and a transition to a new way of doing things, empowered by the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised repeatedly to send to them. That's certainly what they needed. If they were sent forth in their own power, right, go and make it happen, guys. I've kind of given you all the motivational speeches, and yeah, yeah, you're on your own now, but don't worry, you'll be great. That sort of self-belief and empowerment just wouldn't have worked, would it? History tells us that when we just rely on human power, how often that leads to disaster. When people get power, they so often abuse it, don't they? Or perhaps they're scared by it and hide from their responsibilities. It's not a good uh, recipe for success. What they needed, of course, was what Jesus had promised to give them. The Holy Spirit, power from on high, as it's recorded for us in Luke 24. That's what would transform them from quivering wrecks, hiding in locked upper rooms, to people who could stand up in front of a crowd and boldly proclaim Jesus crucified by them and risen again and ascended to the Father's right hand. The Holy Spirit transformed them as messengers and transformed the hearers. How many of those 
who had cried out, crucify him, crucify him, those weeks earlier, were among those who came to salvation on that day of Pentecost that we can read about in Acts chapter 2. They were cut to the heart. The Holy Spirit was working in power to transform them through the word that was spoken and proclaimed boldly by Peter. Making it very clear, uh, Jesus in his expectations, this is not about the nation of Israel coming to faith. He'd come uh, to bring this message through these disciples to all the ends of the earth, and that's where he commands them. My authority extends way beyond national boundaries here. Um, I am the king, I am the saviour to all the ends of the earth. It probably felt daunting enough to those disciples to venture outside Jerusalem, perhaps. And certainly when you start talking about Samaria, that's real foreign territory for a, a good Jew. So we're not even going to get beyond that, thinking to the ends of the earth. But that's the exciting thing about the book of Rome, uh, book of Acts, of course, is that we end the book of Acts with uh, the message of the gospel being heard in Rome, the, the center of the universe of those days. Such power on display. So, so Jesus had kept his promise. You will be empowered from on high. And they did the impossible. By human effort, they brought this message of a, a, an unknown Jew from a up north town who'd been put to death, but who, in whose name there is salvation. And people who had no concern for the God of the Bible, for the God of Israel, who, who despised the Jews and all they stood for, were transformed by that same power to come to faith in this Jesus. God is keeping his promises. Right back in the day when he told Abraham that he would bless the whole world through one of his offspring. Jesus is that offspring. And it's in him that the whole world is knowing the rich blessing of God. The Holy Spirit has power to transform uh, the ministers, those <coughs> recipients, to transform the whole world. And Christ knows that. And commissions his disciples to be the, the, the ones who will take that message out. He's been seen. He's preached. He's ministered. He's fulfilled all that the Father wanted him to do. And now it was time to equip and commission those disciples to go and establish the kingdom through the word of Christ that he brings. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Too many? Paul picks up the glorious power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as he writes to those believers in Ephesus, Chapter 1, verse 18, speaking of the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe. And I wonder, is that, is that knowledge of that power influencing our outlook, our expectations? We can so often be conscious of our own weakness and failings in completing and continuing the, the great commission that Jesus has given to his disciples. We're just not making the impact that uh, we see just a few verses later. Wouldn't it be great to see thousands of people coming to salvation? But that's not really our experience here in Weymouth, is it? And it can be tempting just to think, well, it's not for us. Or maybe there's something wrong with us. Or, But it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same power from on high that we are to look to as we depend upon God in prayer. We don't go in our own power. But it's in our weakness that his power is most clearly displayed. Let us encourage one another, perhaps then, to remind one another that Jesus is the ascended king who has given all that we need to do the job that he's given us. So then we get to the actual ascension, We're spending a bit of time just in the, in the, the build-up to that, and we see that uh, 
He'd finished talking to them, verse 9, and as they were looking on, he was lifted up. And that is a very real physical thing. This is not a metaphor or a figure of speech. Jesus physically rose from earth, if you like, defying gravity, and was fully seen by them as he was taken back to heaven, literally exalted before their eyes. Not to say that the king, kingdom of heaven, the throne of God, is somehow up there in head for Pluto and seven million miles on the left you'll see the entrance to heaven that's not the idea that, that's trying to be conveyed here but we must, we must be clear that it is a physical ascension to a real place there are times uh, of course in our history when people have been able to travel into space and I think was it the first cosmonauts who mocked on their return. Say, so, well, we've been up and had a good look around, but we couldn't see God anywhere. We couldn't see heaven. They thought it was all just a bit of a laugh. You don't need to become astronauts to travel to this real place. It's a real place that's unseen by human eye for most of the time. Very, very occasionally we get those uh, accounts, don't we, of people's eyes being opened so they could see the spiritual realm, the spiritual kingdom that was very real and very much around them. You can read the story in 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, where the servant is given eyes open to see that the chariots and the horsemen of the Lord all around them, protecting them from the enemies who were pressing in upon them. He was scared stiff before he saw that. I don't know what, what the reaction was after he saw it, perhaps. But what a reassurance to know that the realities of the hosts of heaven are very much there, if unseen by human eye. So, just a, a reminder to us, I'm sure you didn't need to be reminded of that, that, that it's a real, a real ascension to a real place that really exists now. It's not an imaginary place. It's not just a, 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 a sort of spirit realm in the sense. It's a, a real place of heaven. If only we would have eyes to see it, which one day we trust we will. But also he was lifted up, as we saw from Luke chapter 24, uh, in worship, lifted up by the disciples and lifted up by those on the receiving end. A cloud receives him from sight so that they can no longer see physically Jesus. He's received into heaven. And Hebrews chapter 1 uh, reminds us of the heavenly perspective as, uh, as prophesied. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 6. And again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds of uh, winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But to, of the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. The hosts of heaven worship the ascended, crowned king of kings. It does us good to be reminded that heaven is... Is real, and the ministry that he's given to us here on earth is not just about those who are here on earth. Yeah, we, we join with uh, innumerable company of saints in worshipping the King Jesus. Well, I think I've probably said this already. The, the cloud, it's not a, it wasn't going to pour with rain. This was a glory cloud that hides uh, the very presence of God from us here on earth so often the appearances of the glory of God are associated with a cloud aren't they? that's really what's going on here in our account in Acts chapter 1 hides him from sight but that doesn't mean he's not in a real place he's crowned not like an earthly king crowned for a few years even 70 years for a queen uh, but crowned forever and ever, as we read from Hebrews chapter 1. Crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death. 
That was such a barrier, wasn't it, as we said earlier, to many accepting Jesus as the Messiah because he had suffered so much. And as we've been going through to Corinthians, we've been seeing there's a barrier to people accepting that Paul could possibly be uh, an apostle of the Messiah because he suffered so much. But Hebrews is making it very clear that there is that link between suffering and glory that's always been there in the scriptures. Those who have suffered would be, be drawn into the glory of God. Jesus experienced nothing different. And we should not be surprised if that's our experience also, that we know the glory of God in the midst of or through suffering. Well, you got all your points together on this one. Power everlasting. He's welcomed and crowned as king of kings in the heavenly realm. But he still reigns on earth, even if he's not seen. We can't gather round his throne and, and join with the angels yet. It's work in progress. He's left the earth, but he's left us to do the work of spreading the good news of his kingdom. That's work in progress, isn't it? And that's work in progress that will continue right up until the time when he returns, when the time is good and ready. And not to get into idle speculations uh, to, as to when that should be. Uh, we, we kind of criticised the uh, disciples for having a wrong focus, didn't we? They had a wrong focus before Jesus ascended, and in a sense they had a wrong focus after he ascended, because they were there staring up into heaven. As if to say, right, well, when's, is he coming back straight away? 20 minutes? No. The, the angels are sent to ask them, well, what are you doing? Not focusing up there anymore. He will return, and he will return in a way that's very visible, just like he's gone visibly, and it will be unmistakable. Every eye will see him, and it will be unavoidable. There's no escape. No, your focus, come bring it down, your focus is on the here and now of what he's just given you as a job to do. Going back to Jerusalem, waiting, and then when empowered by the Holy Spirit, taking the message from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to all the ends of the earth. We know these things, don't we? And that was to be their focus of attention, uh, to proclaim the everlasting power of Jesus. Well, we need to come to a conclusion. Uh, just three uh, implications. That there's probably many more that you may want to, uh, to draw out from familiar teaching about the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. Important truths, aren't they? We focus rightly on the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but let's not sh stop at that. Let's take the opportunities, perhaps even afforded by an annual church calendar, to remind ourselves of the ascension of Jesus, of his power and authority over all of the earth, of his presence here with us. And that will enable us then to have that right focus. An earthly mission is what we're given, not heavenly speculation. We wait for our king to return, but it doesn't mean we're just kind of idly looking to the skies, hoping to catch the first glimpse. As I said in the previous slide, it will be unmistakable when he comes back. We saw a couple of weeks ago, didn't we, from 1 Thessalonians 4, there's going to be plenty of noise, uh, plenty, of, plenty to notice about Jesus returning. So we don't need to be gazing up into the sky and speculating about when he might return. We're given enough to do, and we're to be ready by doing that work. As we exercise this great power of a great king, we do so with humility. How the the work of the kingdom is undermined when we become the power brokers, when we misuse the power in the name of Jesus for our own ends. We need to guard against that, don't we? Having a wrong focus that we're building some sort of empire for ourselves. Perhaps in a small church like this, we, we don't suffer with that, but perhaps in a big church, it could become about building up a big church. And uh, forgetting that we are doing the work of the king wherever he would see us. We do it humbly and dependent upon him. Confident that, yes, that day is coming when he will return. He will usher in the new creation. We will be with him forever in the perfection of God, the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells. Jesus will bring his reign to us.
and we will be with him forever. Well, I hope that's an encouragement to us as we live for him. If you don't know Jesus as your saviour and your king, do you not see from this account that that is your greatest priority? That must be your greatest focus. You may be a great churchgoer. You may be fervent in your reading and, and understanding. But unless you know Jesus for yourself, then that return that we've spoken of will be a day of dread, uh, of judgment, as he casts all who have refused uh, to bow the knee before him in this life, casting them into everlasting destruction, into hell itself. It's a solemn reminder, isn't it, as we close, that uh, that's our business, that we're called to bring a message that alone can deliver from the clutches of hell. A sombering thought, isn't it, to think of our family and friends and colleagues, strangers, so many of them on that path to hell. May God enable us to be faithful in living and proclaiming this message that he's given to us of King Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that the scriptures are so clear, revealing things to us that are beyond our grasp and imagination, uh, but revealed in a way that gives us great certainty and confidence that we serve the true King, the promised King, the King who has all power and authority in heaven and on earth. Lord, may the reality of these things be ever present with us in our hearts and in our minds, shaping our outlook on the world, giving us confidence when we would be so ready to hear the propaganda against us and dismiss uh, our role in this work that you have for us to do. Keeping us humble through the word as we submit to you. Teach us then, we pray, through your word, for the glory of King Jesus we ask it. Amen.